Welcome everybody to the Jake Feinberg Show. My guest today is one of the most unheralded organ players that the world has ever heard over the last century, half century. Growing up in Oklahoma City, he used to listen to AM radio and comp tunes on the piano. When he got involved with his church, his interest in the Hammond B3 became evident and he started to pick up gigs in and around his home state. It was at this time that he caught the ear of legendary tenor man Rudolph Johnson, who asked him to join his group. And I can speak for many music fans that we are glad he did, because their collaboration led to several intense and highly spiritual albums on Gene Russell's black jazz label. While out on the West Coast, he again was overheard by members of the East Bay R&B outfit Tower of Power, and they brought this man aboard. He's done a ton of writing, composing, and up till two thousand from nineteen eighty three to two thousand nine, he was in Carlos Santana's band. Chester Thompson, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. All right, thank you very much. It's an honor to have you, my friend. I I wanted to start by asking you, growing up in Oklahoma City, can you talk about the importance of AM radio? when you were growing up, and how it exposed you to a wide array of music? Well, during our time, you know, that was pretty much all you had. Uh, <laughs> so that, that, you know, FM was early, you know, as far as uh, technology is concerned. Uh, it was important, though, for black Americans. There wasn't a whole lot of channels for black music. And wherever you heard it, it was very important to us wherever we could find it. And uh, that's, that's basically it. Did you, have, did you have a situation where you were picking up channels from, from other states or you look forward to a certain Saturday night or a Sunday night where you would have a DJ or somebody that would expose you to certain blues tunes or something like that? Every now and then I used to, boy, you're asking me some, that, that's a long time ago. But we used to get channels but we used to call them bleed through channels that would come from different places across the country that would be playing jazz. And you would only get it at a certain time of night. And uh, we used to use that as an avenue to pick up on music that you didn't ordinarily hear, or music that we didn't get enough of, and especially living in Oklahoma City. Can you talk about some of the, some of the sounds that you heard that you weren't normally used to hearing? Coming along, I was interested, I've always been interested in horns, even though I play keyboard. I play saxophone for a minute, but I was always interested in jazz, the big band. Uh, I like I like the sound of playing with an ensemble like that. And uh, during those days, I, you had a whole lot more of that than you do today. Yeah, I was going to... the influences you had. When you... Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, you know, when as you were growing up, you know, who were some of the first guys you heard using the Hammond organ outside of the gospel setting? Of course, you know, you had Wild Bill Davis, you had Bill Doggett, which was popular, and then came Jimmy Smith. And once Jimmy hit the scene, that changed it for a long time. Uh, then Jack McDuff and Jim McGriff and uh, Groove Holmes, and uh, it, it developed into that style that we all know today. You know, I'm, I'm being a non-musician, uh, and for my audience, I, I just I'm trying to develop the historical understanding of what it was that made Jimmy Smith so made his sound so distinct. Was it just the mere output of it, or was there something more than that? Well, it was Jimmy. It's what, what he was able to play and use the instrument as a means to reflect what he was feeling inside his body. And the instrument allowed him to do things that a lot of other instruments don't allow you to do. Number one, play your own bass. You could almost be a one-man band other than the drum side of it. And that's what Jimmy was for a long time. And there were many other organ players like Wild Bill Davis, like I mentioned, uh, even Shirley Scott, they play their own bass. But no one with that intensity as Jimmy Smith, to me, uh, to be able to separate the brain and to be two people in this one body playing your own bass and still be able to express 
express yourself and reflect melodies with your other hand. And uh, that was always amazing. And Jimmy did it. He did it as good as it could be done uh, on the Hammond organ. He was the first to really grab my attention, changed everything for me. That's beautiful. I mean, the idea of being two people within one body is... Yeah, that's, that's the way I always look at it. Yeah, I never... That's such a great way of, of looking at it. I, I just... Is that... Was that sort of the appeal or, or why you, you, uh, you went exclusively towards the B3? Because you just... You were looking to, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, do as many things at one time or try to express yourself or express your emotions as much as possible? Well, expressing your emotions would be the number one thing. The instrument dictates which way you go. Uh, the Hammond, I like the challenge because you could play your own bass and you could be this, just like a pipe organ. Though I grew up on the electronic organ, uh, the philosophy is the same, is to really be a one orchestra playing your own bass, being orchestral with the other hand, and playing melodies with your with your lead hand, and uh, it really came from you know I took lessons when I was a kid, and uh, the legit way of playing uh, approaching the Hammond or approaching the organ, and uh, for me it was the Hammond organ, and being able to play my own bass, and and I love the sound of the Hammond, <laughs> the, Hammond with, the Hammond with the Leslie speaker. I fell in love with that sound. I love the way it looked. So, you know, that's the way it was for me. And it still is. When you were growing up, uh, can you talk about um, your, uh, the, the people, uh, your parents, uh, the kind of leader, the people that you, look, that you looked up to and the kind of values that, that you were raised with that allowed you to... Um, to be as disciplined as you were, to learn your craft, and to believe in yourself? You know, the best thing I can say for is my parents are concerned in relationship to what I was able to do for is playing and discipline to play at a certain level was a certain amount of freedom. I was never hammered. Uh, I always loved to play. When the kids were out there throwing a the ball around, I was playing the piano or some form of playing, and was always trying to get to the organ, even though I may have been doing it on the piano because that's all we had. But that's where I first learned to develop hearing a bass line was on the piano. And my parents allowed me the opportunity, along with church, to be able to be free to express myself like that. I was never hindered. That was the best gift that was given to me, was the freedom to find myself. <laughs> that yeah, that was the big one for me. They they weren't they were they, they they were not of the ilk of saying, oh, Chester, you need to find something where you can support your family. They said we, we identify the talent. We may not identif we might not understand it, but we identify it and we want it to flourish. Yeah, pretty much it. That that was pretty much it. Uh, my folks love music. Uh, during our time in, in, in the churches, that was the avenue to, to hear music, to come together, and to fellowship, and music was a big part of it. And during, through that, you develop this discipline, this love, and your parents are infatuated some kind of way in the same environment. And they really just passed that on to me just by bringing me along to be exposed to what they had been exposed to all their lives. And they loved music. And for me, they gave me that freedom of finding the music, encouraging, encouraging me, no matter what style of music it was. They didn't put restrictions on me. Uh, and they, really, I was one of those that didn't really need a whole lot of that because I had so much in my I love it. Right. I love it. I was, that was my life. Oh, just beautiful, beautiful, beautifully put. I, I, when was the first time that you played it for a, a live audience where uh, uh, you kind of felt like, well, this is this is absolutely what I'm going to do? I don't, I don't know if I felt that way, but I remember oh, I must have been nine, ten years old in church. A lot of things happened for me in church. Uh, 
planted a church convention and being asked to be the pianist for the choir for some special event. And for me, I remember that looking out in the audiences and uh, seeing all those eyes and the faces. But it didn't, I, I, never, I was never nervous. Maybe some butterflies, but I was never nervous. That kind of helped break all of that for me because I was exposed to that uh, at a young age. My music teacher wasn't a person that had degrees and all of that where she could pass all the technical information on to me, but she gave me a world of amount of encouragement and exposure and experience through even through the church. They were still people. What I played had to have an effect, and people let you know right away whether or not what you were playing was inspiring for them. And uh, that, that was given to me at an early age. I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, no, that was, that was great. I mean, it's, it, it, you speak to this point of, of um, a larger point of, of what music schools, uh, you know, have kind of turned into um, uh, money. You know, it's been more, it's more about money uh, and, and having a degree, saying, well, I have a master's in this or, you know, I've studied this kind of te technical music, as opposed to the instilling the belief that you can work within a team, that you can listen, that you can share ideas, and I think this is what you're talking about with faith and the church, is that their faith can be used extremely positively. Yes, it can. And, yes. and actually, I think you'd probably be more eloquent than I to talk about the idea of having an inner confidence in yourself and to be self-reliant uh, and, and, and how the church helped mold that. That, during my tenure, uh, during my, my uh, adolescent, uh, when I was a younger person, those were the exposures that a lot of us were exposed to, my wife including, she's not a musician. But some, that's the way it was back in the 50s and the 60s. Things, families, and society have changed since then. Uh, the values have changed in, in a large part in certain areas for like dealing with young people. Uh, to inspire. I don't know if that, how much of that get in things now. But we were inspired. Maybe during some adverse circumstances. But I was always inspired to go forward. And uh, that's pretty much the, the trail or track I've tried to travel uh, my whole adult life. So. Do, you, do you feel that in some ways you were inspired to move forward? To be progressive? to create and to to keep moving forward, but yet it seems now in a, a lot of organized religions, you can take any one of them, Judaism, Catholicism, uh, they want to somehow pull us back to regress, to not think or to inspire, to not feel inspired, but to go back to these roots from a couple hundred years ago. You hear it a lot in our political context where you just say, how are we supposed to move forward uh, as a country or as a world, if we're predicating all of our decisions based on stuff that happened hundreds of years ago. Yeah, there's something to that. There's something to that. Uh, it, it all, I, I believe, and what you believe in as an individual, and what you're able to discover as an individual, because we are that. And what life and faith and religion, what it means to you. You know, God doesn't mean the same thing to everyone, which is amazing to a person like myself. If you look at it, that's amazing. But there are a lot of gods to a lot of different people. And uh, you have to discover and figure out what that means to you as an individual. And I think that's one of the most important, important things that you can use as a tool to help you to get wherever it is you're trying to get to, whether it be through music or doing what you do. Um, I think those are the best avenues and the best way of looking at it as an individual. I, one, one, one reason I've gone on this, on this mission that I'm on, Chester, is because I, I feel very strongly that your generation of musicians is the voices, your voices, although oftentimes you guys would rather be heard than seen, I get that, at the same time, the... Uh, genuine character qualities of 
The people in your generation, the Ndugu Chancellors, the Henry Franklins, the Chester Thompsons, the Calvin Keys, you guys are dripping with authenticity. And I'm 33 years old, and we're living in a time right now that is about as sterile and inauthentic as I've ever seen. It's my one reason that this is important to me is to be able to have your voices heard and to find out what drove you and what inspired you. Because there's not a whole heck of a lot of inspiration going on these days. No, no, I mean, it's a, it's a process of evolution. Some of the things that you, you speak of, if you've never been exposed to and didn't know it exists, it wouldn't matter. <laughs> You'd have to find your way from where you are right now. For us, you know, we, I hate to say that word age, but that is the time. The time that we come along during our period of time, which you're describing, there are a lot of circumstances that dictate your edit, your attitude and how you approach things. And uh, that was the driving force. That was the driving force that made me leave Oklahoma City and travel in that van with Rudolph in for two, three years, uh, living the gypsy life. Number one, though, number one when I get back to it is I love music. I love music, and uh, and I love playing, and that's really what I was about as a young man come along, trying to develop skills, playing the Hammond B3, and uh, that was that was my journey, and probably some of the other guys you mentioned during our time. That's the way it was. You know, there were more. You know, you didn't have a whole lot of technology. Uh, Speak of some of the things that we went through. I mean, I thought it was a great thing. I don't know if the young guys could deal with it now where we had to travel. And I speak of that van and traveling here and traveling there and uh, playing in different clubs. And you don't see playing bands. You don't see musicianship. Uh, you don't see that right in the neighborhood. I had a lot of neighborhood stuff, and I don't feel a lot of neighborhood stuff. So it's different now. You, my son plays, and he's a talented young man. But the opportunities that we had that we thought were maybe a struggle was actually a jewel that helped us to get to where we are today. That doesn't exist now. It was because you. Ha it's because you had to work as a banker, and. It, it, nothing was nothing was given to you. The, the people that you were the, the people that you were that were mentors to you taught you to sing for your supper. You had to earn. There was a hierarchy. When you went to San Francisco, you had to find your. You had to get into the music scene first. But in order to do that, in order to support your family or yourself, you had to work a day job. Wes Montgomery had to work a day job. The problem is now we're the first. My generation is the first generation that has been wholly subsidized by their parents. And now comes yeah. the truth. The truth is we, as a, as a young generation, are trying to make, are trying to uproot and grow and dream, but yet because we've been subsidized by our parents our whole lives, we have, we never, like you said, would be termed, we never had the struggle that was actually the jewel. But let me transition out of that. I need to ask you, what was it about the San Francisco scene or the East Bay scene when you moved out there that that gypsy lifestyle that you fell in love with and, and actually made it your home? Uh, the environment, the people, the people. Uh, you know, during our time, I got here in 66, 67, so psychologically, during, no, during that time. You know, a lot of things that happened during America, you know, you had the civil rights struggle, you had the riots that were burning in, in many big cities in America. Um, but when we got to San Francisco, I saw, well, during that time, <laughs> the logo was peace and love. And when I got here, seeing what I've seen in my life, I felt that. I, that's what I fell in love with. I fell in love with the place, the people, uh, the music scene. At the time I got here, was very inspiring because, amazingly enough, 
I didn't see this in those times, or even in New York, that I saw here in San Francisco. But along with that was this attitude that was so positive. Uh, that that's what that's what I fell in love with. Uh, all the other struggles, the bank and the day gigs and all those things. Uh, when you're young, you don't know. You, you you're still you're still hunting. You're still you're still open. <laughs> as long as you're inspired, you'll you'll always be open. Those things like the bank and the day gigs that we have to take. Uh, that's something that happens. Uh, when we were playing in the club, you still had your family you had to take care of. And that was always the case. But number one, before you get to that point, you have to study your craft. You've got the feel. You've got to be able to play with people. And uh, that's the number one thing. Uh, you're going to get paid. It's a professional situation. You get paid, you take care of your family the way you're supposed to, whether it's a night gig or a day gig. Uh, it's that part of it always exists, no matter how old you are. It's the love of what you're doing and why you're doing it. You know, I, I, I need you to, um, if possible, could you give an example of what was so um, inspiring about that community? What, what you felt that love? What, what did that look like? What did that feel like? It's the people. I saw all kind of people. I saw black people. I saw white people. I saw Asian people. I saw Hispanic people. I saw all kind of people. And I never felt... I always felt when I was in San Francisco that I was a man that just happened to be black. To get right to it, that's what I always felt. So as a black man, uh, my inspirations came from a lot of different places. That was one. And, uh, and that had to come from the people. And then came the music. And there was a lot of great music and a lot of clubs where we used to have some great experiences, jamming with great, great musicians when they'd come from town. I can remember quite a few times playing these jam sessions at Jack's on Sutter Street and all the different great musicians that would maybe leave their gig at the jazz workshop on Broadway in San Francisco. And after 2 o'clock, that's where they would go for the after-hour place and jam all night and play and sweat. And jam sessions of, in the, at 5 o'clock in the morning on the weekend where you'd see all these horn players. But that don't exist anymore. You know, I was, Jesus, in my 22, something like that, and you're 33. Nothing like that exists anymore. That's just a, kind of like a storybook thing. It, it does, it does, it does, Chester, one reason I'm just so, you know, animated is because it totally seems like it's a, it's a total fantasy to think that that actually occurred, that you could go to the Fillmore District and see uh, uh, S Saturday jam sessions all night and then it would reopen at Sunday at 6 in the morning to do it all over again is mind-boggling. Yeah, no, uh, you know, when I talk to people about that part of my my exposure for his playing in San Francisco in the 60s, uh, and I tell them about that experience with the jam sessions uh, early on Saturday morning and Sunday morning. That happened nowhere else in America that I know of. And it sounded like, it sound like a fantasy. It sounded like something you, someone made up. But it was amazing. It was an amazing time. And and it was the people, the attitude. Uh, it was just it was just for me as a young man growing up, the place to be. So how did you meet Rudolph Johnson? Uh, Oklahoma City. And it was um you guys you met through through a musical collaboration? Did you grow up together? How did that all that that's an amazing friendship and musical uh, partnership. Uh, actually, I replaced Bob Pierce when uh, I joined Rudolph's band. You know, Bobby told me a great story about Rudolph, and, and it was I, it almost brought me to tears. I went to see Bobby played at the at the concert that I promoted in South Central, and he talked about when he first met Rudolph, how 
he was struggling. They weren't connecting. They weren't on the same page. In some ways, Bobby knew he was overwhelmed um, by the whole thing. And he went to Rudolph and he said, you know, I want to play with you so bad. I want to learn. I want to play with you. But I'm struggling and I can't, I need help. I need you to, to teach me. And it was a microcosm of the, of the human uh, philosophy at that time, which what Rudolph's response was, let's go to work. And instead of kicking a dog while he was down, he brought him back, he picked him back up, and they flourished from there. But it was being able to be secure enough with yourself to acknowledge that you needed some guidance, and then that person to come along and say, hey, I'll teach you. That stood out in my mind when Bobby told me that story. It speaks to the character of Rudolph Johnson, another guy who did, who was, a, who was just a really large character. I was hoping that, uh, you know, you, uh, you, that, that was the Rudolph Johnson, obviously, that you knew as well. Oh, yeah, Rudolph and I, you know, during my tenure with, with, uh, with Rudy's band was that. He was kind of like a big brother to me. Uh, I was a young guy. Um, had some skills and a lot of ambition, and I wanted to wanted to see things, and I wanted to play a certain style of music, and I didn't mind a challenge. And Rudolph had plenty of that, and he and I studied. And there was a time in my life where I could do that. I mean, so many times where we just, when one of the other guys were out, you know, in the clubs partying, we were in the books. We were in the books. I learned so much from this man, not only music, but how he deal with life. And uh, I miss him. Absolutely. I, the the trio was uh, organ, uh, horn, and drums? Yes. And who was the drummer? Uh, Herschel Davis. Herschel Davis. And, and so... I can't envision a lot of trios like that at that time. Was it somewhat cutting edge? Yeah, a little bit. You know, during that time, uh, we, as an organ group, we we were inspired by a lot of John Coltrane music, especially with Rudolph. Uh, Rudy was a great player, and we did a lot of train tunes. But then at the same time, Herschel was our vocalist, so whatever was popular during that time, we also did that too. And, you know, to be honest, you know, you had to do that during the days to work. You had to have both. And uh, that's how we survived during that. But for me, I didn't look at it as a survival situation because, once again, as a young man just inspired to be involved, it was just one more experience for me to be able to go from John Coltrane to playing Aretha Franklin. That was fine for me. Apple, I can. I, that would. That would be. That's extremely expansive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so you actually, uh, the drummer uh, Herschel Davis. He, he was. He was. He sang songs. Yes, he did. Were you doing, uh, were you, were you, you said you guys were in the books quite a bit. Were you, uh, take, take me through, if you would, like a, a night at the Matador or, or Jimbo's Bob City or wherever you like to play. Um, would you play a lot of original stuff that you guys were working on at that time? Or like you said, you, you had to play hot covers to, uh, to keep a steady gig. How did, how did you work in your set lists? We did, we did all of the above, you know, we did a, we did a four set. Uh, evening, uh, which allowed you, you know, most bands during those days, probably still, you know, the first set is a set that allow you to explore around. You might try some original songs. The, the place isn't full with people yet. Uh, you use that first set for that. We did that uh, for studying and what Rudolph and I studied for his books are concerned. Hey, he was that was, that's the way he was. He always practiced. I mean, he practiced used from the books, saxophone books, virtuoso books. But he also was a yogi, so he meditated. He'd go in the closet and <laughs> he'd lock himself up in that closet. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he'd play that saxophone. He'd practice on how much pressure he would put on the keys. And uh, we, we would, 
did. I, I was studied out of the saxophone books. We also, there was a, a, a musical philosophy called the Lydian Concept that he and I studied out of. And uh, we would write tunes and would convert them to Lydian. Uh, and that was very interesting. It allowed you to have another tonal center. And uh, it was good when you started to talk about playing free. Uh, so that that was that experience. That was Rudolph and I, uh, our little uh, collaboration. Uh, just with, well, I can't say collaboration because it happened all the time we were together. But it was also uh, because of the studying and the and the, uh, the, te- the the tonal changes that you were experimenting with. There was an intellectual bent to it, and it was sophisticated. It was good. Uh, it yeah. was it was cool. It was very good, and you know, it was, it was a great time to do that. Can you you know? Uh, you know, Chester. One reason I originally um, discovered, I, I found, uh, you know, the the album Powerhouse in the East Village of New York a couple of years ago, and I said, "My gosh, I've never heard of this guy before." And I put it on, and and um, you know, I, I, it was it was produced um, by a, a really uh, special guy who um, who I who I who I miss. I never knew him, but I know that I identify with him. That was was Gene Russell, and. You know, I'm trying to figure out, and I was hoping you could color in for me. How did Gene? How did Gene know, or what was the process in which he went about finding guys like yourself, and and to know that they were that you guys deserved a time to be a leader on your album on your album? I just was hoping you could talk a little bit about the philosophy of the Black Jazz label, and and how it changed your career. Well, for Gene, Gene was trying to develop something, if I remember correctly. He was trying to develop a company where he had versatility uh, with, uh, with the musicians and the people that own his label. And when it got to the organ slot, my name was mentioned. Uh, Gene came up and heard me perform at a local club in San Francisco, and we went from there. Um, the philosophy that Jane had for his black jazz is concerned was to try to be, to try to create, to create something that was competitive, uh, I won't say equal, but competitive to the other labels that were out there doing similar music like Blue Note. And you know what kind of lineup they had on that label. They, uh, the way it was structured for his organ groups, saxophone band, guitar band, uh, like that. And that's what I believe Gene was trying to do. It seemed to me there was also this idea that somehow there was the acceptable black musician to the mainstream le- le- record companies like Capitol, Columbia, and then there were the people that were shunned or not recognized. It was being able to to shine a spotlight on those people who were not recognized or not accepted as a safe black musician. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could look at it like that, but being black jazz and uh, most of the artists were black musicians. Uh, And it's a tough industry to get accepted by larger labels. And... It was a time, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it seemed like Gene was involved with another label called Ovation Records. I could be wrong about that. I think Ovation was the parent company with Gene Shorey in Chicago, and yeah. they gave him some money to start up the Black Jazz. I guess you know what I... I, I, I want you to put it in, in Jake fi- terms that my, my brain can understand, but, like, for instance, when he's, he said... You said... He, you came on his radar as somebody who would qua- who would be a good organ player for the Black Jazz. Explain that. Were, were you just somebody would say, "Hey, Chester's doing some some great stuff. He sounds great. He's the perfect candidate." How how did that? How did he choose? Because the 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 pedigree of the people on these on this label were were strong, and they had they were rooted in all the things 
that speak to the greatness of this country. They were, they were Afrocentric, they believed in black awareness and black consciousness, but not in violence, but by identifying and being proud of who they were. And it's very clear to me through the images and through the music that that's what was being, that, that's what was being focused on was not what, the, not what the major record companies wanted or what they thought America wanted, what, what people wanted here, but this was people just cutting it loose and saying, this is who I am and I am proud of who I am. I am not, uh, you know, it, it just, it was very overt. It was right out there in your face. It's stuff that I dig, man. I dig it. Well, I, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. I, I'd agree with that. Uh, thinking about Gene and all the different artists, uh, I would agree. Yeah, I can't add anything to that. Uh, I'd agree with that. <laughs> no, I'm just, I, you know, I, I guess to me it was also something in that period of time, the, the idea that that was even, uh, so, uh, that was even, that it was able to get into the ears of people. You know, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is when Powerhouse was first cut, what state, what radio stations were, were important in promoting that album? Huh. Well, up here it was KJS and whatever the sister, sister company, I mean, sister station in L.A., I don't know what that one would be, but it was a jazz, it was a jazz format. So that, that's what you were dealing with, number one. Uh, for the other, for the other FM channels or the AM channels or any of that, picking up your product, I don't think it was designed to do that. I think it was designed to do exactly what it did. Uh, he was probably hoping for more support, but he had a definite, a definite concept, and just with the name Black Jazz and what he was trying to do with that label and what he was trying to say by just the name. And the way the the way it looked, the black and white label, um, was reflecting on black Americans and giving musicians that were great players another avenue to be exposed and to show the crowd. It was also the image of the of the the two hands clasped together, the unison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Chester, did you were you involved in the um, in the uh, recent Yoshi's reunion of black jazz players? No, I wasn't. Was that by choice? No, I was probably working. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think, like I said, I mean, and that's good. I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, uh, I definitely want to touch on what you're doing in 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 today's music world, but. Um, you know, uh, it, but it wasn't a situation where all the guys on the label were uh, intimately connected. I mean, the idea, like, just taking the example of uh, the guys that were on your albums, it wasn't like you were uh, extremely close with those other guys, like the Skipper or Calvin Keys or, or, uh, or you know, Woody Shaw and Dugu Chancellor, whoever it was. It wasn't like a family. Uh, would, would, it, would, it, would it be considered a family or no? No, not not really. Uh, whatever family you may pick up from the label, I, I would give Gene credit for that. So talk a little bit about, I just, I need to know this because I played the songs quite a bit. Uh, uh, Weird Herald, Trip I One. Knew, I, I knew you were going to say that. Where is Weird Herald? Who is Weird Herald? He was a friend of mine, a <laughs> uh, guy that I knew in Salt Lake City, Utah, back in the 60s. And he used to come in his club, and that's what they used to call him, Weird Harold. And uh, <laughs> I named the song after him. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. T, I assume, is you. Uh, yes. Yeah, that, I mean, and where did the, uh, tell, I showed my daughter this morning, uh, I show I showed her the album, and you know you're. It, I'm just trying to figure out how it was desi- how it was chosen that you were going to sit on a stoop, uh, you know, with a a, a a pretty determined look on your face. I mean, it, it 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 has the look of determination. Did you have any say in that, or was that just sort of choreographed to try to sell albums? Oh, the album cover. Exactly. 
Oh, it's just postures and poses. You know, it's funny, the, the lady that they use for those leaps for me, uh, that photographer, we went around to different little sites in the city, and we ended up at one spot, I can't remember, I don't remember if it was on, oh, for some reason I'm thinking Oak Street, some kind of way. Uh, there was a fire <laughs> on the corner. <laughs> and uh, she wanted me to get on the steps, and I, we were everybody was caught up on watching this fire, and the trucks were flying by, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what was going on the day I took that photo. You're probably like, I got to pretend that I'm, I'm really, I, I'm really want to be distracted by this fire, but I got to look at this camera right now. Oh no, it was, it was all good. It was all good. I had no weird thoughts going on in my head. Young guy trying to make an impression. And I wanted it to look a certain way, and they wanted it to look a certain way. You know, a lot of you know, a lot of stuff for the look. I have to give it a gene because even with Rudy and Calvin and and some of the other albums, the look you you see a kind of a common thread running through some things when you look at all those albums. And I think that thread was Eugene Russell. It was also. You're exactly right, because what it was was a the new generation. It was Doug Karn. It was Chester uh-huh. Thompson. It was a young, optimistic, spiritual, black man or woman that was proud of who they were. They were aware of who they were, and they were sophisticated. And the more guys I talk to now, um, they, and I was curious as to your you know, again, I'm not tapped into BET or other, but or black media. But a lot of guys talk about how the black media in our country today doesn't even know this stuff took place. Is that fair? They don't know what I'm sorry, I'm misunderstood. No, I just my my question is a lot of the black media in in, in our world today is not even aware of of what took place musically during that time. It, it's it's almost non-existent. I wouldn't say they didn't. They wouldn't. Where I just think they're living in the now. And in the now, you know, and in business, that's where the focus is. Uh, I just think some of the younger, young, some, some of it did not get passed on to some of the younger guys that are in control now, that are in charge. What didn't and get the, passed on? Well... Just the attitude, and what you what you perceive by what you just just made a statement on. Uh, during our time, when Black Jazz was around, that was no rap other than James Brown. <laughs> hey, you know, and I, well, the you know there was there was rap, but it was being spoken about real social issues. The Last Poets or Gil Scott Heron. Oh yeah, that was oh, rap. Yeah. But they were talking yeah. about real things. They weren't talking about this. I, I just, I look at young black America today, you know, I'm a white Jewish guy, I mean, what do I know? But I don't even know if they, they're really, they're angry. And I don't know if they know what they're angry at, because, you know, it, it's a lot of denigration of a lot of stuff, and I don't hear a lot of coalescing around real issues that could generate, that could really galvanize a, a, a culture. Well... You know, when they rap, all they're doing is just like anyone, like Gil Scott and Heron, uh, with, their, with their lyrics, is describing the life in which they, what they see in their daily lives. It may sound the way you describe, but that's what they see and that's all they see. We're also living in times where young people do not have two parents. I think a lot of us grew up having two parents, and that makes a difference. And you have a lot of young men, I say young men, I'm sure they're young women too, that when they rap and when they describe their lives and what they see every day, that may not be the view of everybody on the globe or in America or in the city that they're describing, but for them, that's it. Uh, we may not like it. It may come out quite abrasive. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether you're white or black. Uh, when you start talking about pulling the trigger, that has an effect. But 
if this is alive, these guys are living, right or wrong, right or, or whatever, to be indifferent about what they're saying. That's their life, and that's really what they're describing. Um, it's a shame when it gets acted out on, but that's, that's what you're looking at. You know, uh, that's very, very well said, man. I, I, I think the, you know, the idea of a stable nuclear family, you're right, it has gone away. It's destabilized homes, and you have, you don't have the, you don't have the mentors um, in place in the black community that are, are necessary, and I don't know enough about, I mean, I look at you and the way the church, how fundamentally the church instilled these values, these core values, and you're, I'm sure there were, there were men in there that just seemed like mountains, um, uh, and women too. And I don't, I don't know the, the, the outlets in communities now. I mean, a lot, a lot of things have occurred because a lot of youth, can, even, whether you're black or white or Indian, doesn't matter, they can get their hands on technology, digital stuff, and they can, feel, they can get kind of lulled into complacency. And it's been it, that has taken the place of instruments and the ability to create and the idea of art and the idea of, of theater. Th those those careers, they aren't careers anymore. And especially in the black community that has the most soul, one some of the some of the most beautiful. I mean, some, the best art in our, in our country has been created by African Americans. That seems that outlet has been cut off. And now it's either sports or you turn to the streets. It certainly is an education. Well, I can't say that because I just left. And you live in Arizona, right? I, uh, Tucson, yeah. Tucson. Yeah, maybe, maybe in Arizona it looks like that. Um, I just left Louisiana and some other places in the south. And I, I, I left there with the total different impression, especially with education. Please, That's please, please tell. Please talk to force. me. That's the number one driving force. Um, they, they're very educated. But education and change in people's attitude, you can't find that in a book. You cannot find it. And perception can be accepted and twisted. And others outside of that, like yourself, observing, will walk away with what you're, what you're speaking of. And I can understand uh, how you're speaking and why you're speaking and how you see it. But it's not straight across like that. It's not the one paintbrush. I'm not, the only reason I paint with that brush is so I can bring on Chester Thompson to talk about what you see. Because you're the one that has to explain to me. It's not my job. It's it's that's why I'm bringing you guys because I know Chester, the spirit inside of you only through the music, and the pictures and your relationships with people. Uh -huh. So I know you're the one that has to do that coloring for me. I know I painted with a broad brush, because I only I have had limited experiences. So I need people like yourself to, based on your travels, to come back and instill that in Jake Feinberg and the hope, and let me know that these things are actually. Really, we're actually making a lot of progress because I, I, at the core, that's all I am is a is a fan. I'm a fanatic. I'm a big fan of music, and I love and I love life, and I love my life, and I want you guys to be able to tell me the other good things that are going on in the in the communities that you see that I don't. Yeah, but you know, you see, you see a lot because we're living in today's times, and in today's times, no matter which complexion. Uh, economic, educational, we're all kind of in the same boat. <laughs> uh, that's what, that's been my experiences and what I've seen traveling around America. Uh, there are a lot of people in the same boat. Uh, boys like uh, what you described with black Americans with, you know, don't want to go to school, don't want this education. Uh, you only hear what you get off of the box. Yeah. From through the media. Yeah. Uh, these are the pictures. And this isn't new. This is something old. This is old. This was happening when I was a young man, how things were reflected. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not true. It's not true. I lived through it. I lived through worse times than this. 
and uh, it's not true. So. Well, that's. I mean, it's it's uh, it's good to know. I think that because we're we as a society we feel a little bit more. Uh, and this is not true, but you you, could, you you refer to the box as the television. You could turn that tell. You only had three three channels, and and uh, you could turn that thing off, and you didn't have the internet, and you could really disconnect from anything going on in the outside world. Yet now, we're so interconnected, and we're we're a much more emotion driven society. That I one reason I'm sort of in a in a a search and a journey for this is because. Uh, like our media, for instance, it, it's all it's all surrounding, and it gives the impression that things are really much worse than they are. Yeah, yeah, things are bad too. You know, there's it, no, there's nothing you can stick your head in the sand about. Um, things that problems that the world have right now are real. It's just how we deal with it and how we handle it. And that's all of us, because, you know, like, with America's problem, as far as economics is concerned, and with everything uh, we're constantly fighting about for is politics, Washington, D.C., um, it's a global link. But we have to be careful here at home how we look at all of that. You know, a lot of us don't get a chance to get exposed to what's happening outside of America, and we're kind of spoon-fed. And even if there were only three channels, I guarantee everybody would be watching those three channels. <laughs> That's how this thing all started. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I, you know, uh, Chester, you, uh, in the early 70s, um, I, you know, I, I read somewhere where you said you had retired from the road at that point, <laughs> but you were playing in San Francisco and... Um, you were discovered by uh, Tower of Power, or, or I, I want to know who, how you got lured into that band because I'm sure happy it happened. But I, I just would like you to talk talk about th how that all thing came to conception. Well, you know, after the little trio with Rudy, uh, after we broke up, and I decided to stay in San Francisco, and I was working at B of A, and I was a young man trying to. Right there at the crossroads. I did, am I going to stay and get a what we call a square gig and try another profession? Or am I going to hang in here with the music thing? Uh, I hung in there with the music thing. Uh, I was playing with a local saxophonist in San Francisco, Jules Broussard. And I was a guitar player. They used to come by and see me, see us play all the time from Tower of Power. And it was a time in Tower of Power's career, uh, doing, it was a time in Tower of Power when they wanted to add a keyboardist. And they asked if I'd like to do the audition. And I always said in my mind, I'd always said that if I was going to play a style of music commercially, that would be it. Because I identified with the lyrics, I identified with the arrangements, uh, identified with the harmonics. Um, we used to sing the song, <laughs> a friend of mine, we used to sing Still a Young Man when I was working at the bank. Oh, man, this is so great. God. Before, before I joined Tower Power, we used to sing that song, sing that song. Who used to know I was going to be offered the job to play with them? And, uh, yeah. You know... So, yeah, the guitarist, uh, Bruce Conti. Bruce Conti. Bruce Conti. Bruce Conti. He was the guitarist with uh, Tower Power back in the when I joined the band. I think he joined in '72, and I joined in '73. I think it also accentuated another thing that I want my audience to realize about about Chester Thompson is that you were. I'm not going to let you run away, let, hide from this, but you were, you know, one of the best, in my opinion, uh, uh, R&B soul. Uh, writers, the, the the songs that the Squib Cakes, the other songs that you have uh, written that you wrote for Tower Power, those were the funkiest tunes around, man. You know, you you were able to get your you you want your knee, you want to pat your knee, you want to you want to do some music that people are going to dance to. I, I just I guess my question is, 
when you how do you create a song like that? Where does the germ start? How do how does how, you get a you get a theme in your head? You get an image in your head, like a, a tune like Squib Cakes, for instance. Well, tune like Squib Cakes came from when I was working really with Rudy Johnson as a. It was a style of playing the bass and the way we used to play whatever was popular at the time, like I mentioned Aretha Franklin, uh, Rock Steady or something. Uh, but it was just the way we used to do those kind of songs with a little, with, with a little trio. And to me, Squib Cakes is a swing tune with the backbeat. And Squib Cakes came along, actually that's just the way I play. And that's really where that song comes from. I came up with a theme and uh, a horn arrangement. And then we organized it and created an aura for each soloist. And uh, that's basically what Squid Cakes is about. You know, it's a funky tune with a backbeat, but it still swings. Uh, th- that's, I, I'm so glad you brought that term up. I, could you explain to the audience about backbeat? Because from what I... What I gather is sort of the, uh, you might have heard it with like Lee Morgan's, the Sidewinder, uh, some of the, the Herbie Hancock Tower of Power, but what, for the lay person, what, what was it about the backbeat that changed during that early 70s period of, of, of music? Well, I, I don't know if you can all lay it, you know, relate squib cakes to that era because it came up during a time, my thinking, the backbeat aspect was what you feel when you're sitting there listening to a funk song and you're patting your foot. Anything that'll make you pat your foot, even if you're not dancing, is what you're trying to achieve. And the backbeat is normally a part of that structure. Um, And the backbeat consists of two and four, playing two and four with the snare drum, and one and three with the bass drum. I mean, as simple as you can get it. And uh, eighth notes, which are high hat. Actually, with squib cakes, it was what we call a dotted eighth sixteenth, spangalang type of rhythm that jazz players used to do swing on a ride cymbal. And uh, that's what squib cakes rhythmically is based on. Were you. Like when you guys would tour, would you go on? Did you ever uh, play with uh, uh, groups like Malo or Azteca or or El Chicano, the the uh, the, the real uh, the Latin swing groups of that time? During those times, you know, with Bill Graham, Bill used to put a lot of different idioms and groups together that you wouldn't do today. You know, if it's uh, if it's all rap, it's all rap. If it's all funk, it's all funk. If it's all country, it's all country. If it's all rock, it's all rock. You don't have nothing uh, fusing together. Bill would do that. He would put Miles Davis with Janis Joplin in a minute. And the groups that you mentioned, that's how that occurred during the Tower of Power days. Uh, we would just be sharing the same show, sharing the same bill. And uh, that's the way they did it in the 70s. At least that's the way Bill did it. Yeah, there were many shows that uh, Miles, oh, Miles would open for the Grateful Dead, for instance. Yeah. And, yeah. Every, and that's, that's, that's the way it was in the 70s. I missed that. I, dude, that's what, that's what I, you know, Chester, I mean, I, was, I wasn't even born, you know? I wasn't yeah. even around, but it's like, and there are plenty of young cats that, you know, they feel it too. Luckily, we still collect the records and we keep digging. And I get a chance to interview guys like yourself who, you know, you guys are the unsung heroes, man. And I also look at it and I say to myself, the urban areas of this country, they all, that there was a, a certain black consciousness. It was slightly different depending on where you were. In Houston, you had the Crusaders. You know, you had the Bay Area and the Southern California scenes. You had the vibrancy of the Blue Note, the the New York to Boston scene. You had a great Detroit scene with Phil Randall and the vibes from the tribe. It just seemed like collectively there were pockets. And and, and in 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 this great way, it was able to just continue the momentum together. And I just would love to be able to in some way, uh, not re-educate, just... Uh, I don't know what the right word is, but 
But I just want to expose people to what, how, why that time was so special. And I just believe it was because, like you said, it was full acceptance of race, and it was a cross cross collaboration. It, it, you know, oh, we got Tower of Power. Hey, let's let's link them up with, um, you know, with some acid rock group. It, it, it'll it'll work because you bring in diverse, different crowds, and all of a sudden people are getting turned on to different things. That's right. That's right. Why did the, why did that inherently in your mind? Why did that go away? Uh, well, promoters changed it. You know, uh, record companies. Uh, you don't have big festivals like we used to do in the day. You know, nothing like they have in Europe today. I don't know if you've been to any of the festivals in Europe, the outdoor festivals that will last a week. They kind of emulate Woodstock. Here you don't have that kind of, you might have a two, three day festival and it's gone. Uh, you don't have the same thing, same hunger. And I don't know if that, that and it, it has to come from your promoters because they're the one that's building it and what they believe in. They think their audience won't accept it that way. Um, why they took that route, I don't know. I, I don't know. But when Bill Graham was alive and one mark and one fingerprint that he put on the business was that, was... I won't say collaboration, but being able to view different idioms, different artists at the same time, on the same bill at least, which would give people the opportunity to be exposed to something that they had not planned on it, that, that they wouldn't do in their own normal environment. And uh, it was a good thing. It was a good thing. I missed that. Talk a little bit about... Um your involvement today, like what what uh what are you doing professionally, uh, musically, and I, I want I really hope the answer is yes to this, but do you find yourself working with young kids at all? Not yet, not yet. Uh, I'm not at that point yet. Uh, I do have thoughts of doing that, being able to give back and to give back to the young ones. Uh, to be able to carry on or pass on some, something that's important, at least in my mind. Uh, but today, not yet. Not yet. So what are you doing? You, you've been in Europe and you've been playing. What kind of band are you in right now? You're not with uh, Carlos anymore. No, I'm not. I left him in 2009. So right now, I'm, I'm not... I have a little thing that I'm doing at the Fairmont. Uh, there's a local this jockey here in the Bay Area named Pete Falico that's an organ enthusiast and each year Jesus for the last 10, 15 years I guess maybe longer he's had these organ seminars that he put on and before some of the legends passed away they would be at some of these some Jimmy Smith and McGriff and some of the younger ones like Joey DiFrancesco and Lonnie Smith. Well, he's doing one of these things in San Francisco at the Fairmont Hotel on the 24th. And I've been asked to put a band together for that. And uh, from there, we just take it one step at a time and see what happens. Chester, hang on the line for one second, my friend. I just, I just wanted to, uh, as we wrap up the interview, man. I just, I, uh, I look forward to um, talking with you in the future uh, as I continue my journey. Uh, I, my goal is to uh, essentially um, try to, to, to get you guys to continue to play this music so we can put it into the ears of youth and uh, to let them know uh, that there are great leaders out there, especially in the black community. Um, that can really help us move forward um, as a country. So I, I just thank you so much for being a part of my program. My pleasure.